"'I suppose you get stuff of that kind through your hands pretty often,' said Mr. Dillett, as he pointed with his stick to an object which shall be described when the time comes. And when he said it, he lied in his throat, and he knew that he lied. Not once in twenty years, perhaps not once in a lifetime, could Mr. Chittenden, skilled as he was in ferreting out the forgotten treasures of half a dozen countries, expect to handle such a specimen. "'How much you sticking the innocent American buyer for it, eh?' "'Oh, I shan't be hard on the buyer, American or otherwise. "'You see, it stands this way, Mr. Dillett. "'If I knew just a bit more about the pedigree, "'though anyone can see for themselves it's a genuine thing, "'every last corner of it, "'I should be asking rather more than I am. "'And um, what's that, five and twenty? "'Well, multiply that by three and you've got it, sir. Seventy-five's my price. "'And fifty's mine,' said Mr. Dillett. "'The point of agreement was, of course, somewhere between the two. It does not matter exactly where, I think sixty guineas. But half an hour later the object was being packed, and within an hour Mr. Dillett had called for it in his car and driven away. Mr. Chittenden, holding the cheque in his hand, saw him off from the door with smiles, and returned, still smiling, into the parlour, where his wife was making the tea. He stopped at the door. "'It's gone,' he said. "'Thank God for that,' said Mrs. Chittenden, putting down the teapot. "'Mr. Dillett, was it?' "'Yes, it was. "'Well, I'd sooner it was him than another.' "'Oh, I don't know. "'He ain't a bad fellow, my dear.' "'Maybe not. "'But in my opinion, he'd be none the worse for a bit of a shake-up.' "'And what, then, of Mr. Dillett and his new acquisition? "'What it was, the title of the story will have told you. "'What it was like, I shall have to indicate as well as I can.' There was only just enough room for it in the car, and the drive was an anxious one. At last his door was reached, and Collins, the butler, came out. Uh, "'Look here, Collins, you must help me with this thing. We must get it out upright, see? It's full of little things that mustn't be displaced more than we can help. I think we'll have to put it in my own room, on the big table. Yes, that's it.' It was conveyed to Mr. Dillett's spacious room on the first floor, looking out on the drive. The sheeting was unwound from it and for the next hour or two Mr. Dillett was fully occupied in extracting the packing and setting in order the contents of the rooms. When this congenial task was finished, I must say it would have been difficult to find a more perfect and attractive specimen of a doll's house in Strawberry Hill Gothic than that which now stood on Mr. Dillett's knee-hole table. It was quite six foot long, including the chapel and oratory, which flanked the front on the left as you faced it, with the stable on the right. The chapel had pinnacles and buttresses, and a bell in the turret. The stable was of two stories, with a clock, and a gothic cupola for the clock bell. Pages might be written on the outfit of the mansion. How many frying pans, how many gilt chairs, carpets, pictures, and chandeliers there were, but that must be left to the imagination. The house was also fully populated with a gentleman and lady in blue satin and brocade, respectively. There were two children, a boy and a girl. There was a cook, a nurse, a footman, and there were the stable servants, two postilions, a coachman, two grooms. "'Anyone else?' inquired Mr. Dillett. "'Yes, possibly.' The curtains of the four-poster in the bedroom were closely drawn around all four sides of it, and he put his finger in between them and felt in the bed. He drew the finger back hastily, for it almost seemed to him as if something had, not stirred perhaps, but yielded in an odd live way as he pressed it. Then he put back the curtains and extracted from the bed a white-haired old gentleman in a long linen nightdress and cap and laid him down by the rest. The tale was complete. That night Mr. Dillett's whim was to sleep, surrounded by some of the gems of his collection. There was no striking clock within earshot, yet curiously it is indubitable that Mr. Dillett was startled out of a very pleasant slumber by a bell tolling one. Though there was no light at all in the room, the doll's house stood out with complete clearness. There were lights, more than one, in the windows, and Mr. Dillett quickly realised that what he was looking at was no four-roomed house with a movable front, but one of many rooms and staircases, a real house, but seen as if through the wrong end of a telescope. 
You mean to show me something, he muttered to himself, and gazed earnestly on the lighted windows. Two rooms were lighted, one on the ground floor to the right of the door, one upstairs on the left. The first brightly enough, the other rather dimly. The lower room was the dining room. A meal had been eaten, and only wine and glasses were left on the table. The man of the blue satin and the woman of brocade were seated alone, and they were talking earnestly. The former abruptly rose and left the room, and the expression on the lady's face was that of one striving her utmost to keep down a fear that threatened to master her, and succeeding. It was a hateful face, too, broad, flat, and sly. Now the man came back, and she took some small thing from him and hurried out. He too disappeared, but a moment later he could be seen stepping out of the front door, looking this way and that, and then turning to the upper window that was lighted, and shaking his fist. It was time to look at the upper window. Through it was seen a four poster bed, a nurse or other servant in an armchair, sound asleep, and in the bed, an old man lying awake, and, one would say, anxious from the way in which he shifted about and moved his fingers. Beyond the bed a door opened, and the lady came in. She set down her candle on the table and roused the nurse. In her hand she had an old-fashioned wine bottle, ready uncorked. The nurse took it, poured some of the contents into a little silver saucepan, added some spice and sugar from casters on the table, and set it to warm on the fire. The old man pointed to the window and spoke. The lady nodded, opened the casement, and listened for something, perhaps rather ostentatiously, then drew in her head and shook it, looking at the old man, who seemed to sigh. By this time the posset was ready. The old man waved it away, but he was prevailed upon to drink it, after which the nurse laid him down, the lady left the room, and there was an interval of complete quiet. Suddenly the old man started up in his bed. He must have uttered some cry, for the nurse started out of her chair. He was a sad and terrible sight, flushed in the face almost to blackness, the eyes glaring whitely, both hands clutching at his heart, foam at his lips. The nurse threw open the door and cried for help. But as the lady, her husband, and several servants rushed into the room with horrified faces, the old man collapsed under the nurse's hands and lay back, and the features, contorted with agony and rage, relaxed slowly into calm. A few moments later, a coach drove up to the front door. A white-wigged man in black ran up the steps, carrying a small trunk-shaped box. He was met by the man and his wife, who led him to the dining-room, where he set his box of papers on the table while he listened to their story. He repeatedly nodded his head, declined what seemed an offer of refreshment, and within a few moments left the house and drove away. The man in blue watched him depart, a smile not pleasant to see stealing over his fat white face. The light then faded. Mr. Dillett remained sitting up in bed. He had rightly guessed there would be a sequel. This time the chapel was lit. On the centre of the black and white pavement was a bier. A pall of black velvet lay on the floor nearby, and a large candlestick had been overturned. Suddenly Mr. Dillett's attention was arrested by a strange light away at the top of the house. It was a new sort of light, not of a lamp or candle, a pale, ugly light, emanating from the door-case at the back of a room where the boy and girl were lying asleep in two truckle beds. The door was opening. The seer does not like to dwell upon what he saw entering the room. He says it might be described as a frog, the size of a man, but it had scanty white hair about its head. It was busy about the truckle beds, but not for long, the sound of cries, infinitely appalling, reached the ear. There were signs of a hideous commotion all over the house. Lights moved along and up, doors opened and shut, and running figures passed within the windows. The clock in the stable turret told one, and darkness fell again. It was only dispelled once more to show the house front, 
dark figures came down the steps, bearing first one, then another small coffin. The next morning, Mr. Dillett sent for the doctor, who found him in a disquieting state of nerves. He recommended a dose of sea air, and Mr. Dillett duly repaired to a quiet place on the east coast by easy stages in his car. One of the first people he met on the front was Mr. Chittenden, who likewise had taken his wife away for a bit of a change. Mr. Chittenden looked somewhat askance upon him when they met, and not without cause. "'Well, I don't wonder at you being a bit upset, Mr. Dillett. I might say horrible upset, seeing what me and my poor wife went through ourselves. But I'll put it to you, Mr. Dillett, one of two things. Was I going to scrap a lovely piece like that, on the one hand, or was I going to tell customers, I'm selling you a regular picture palace drama to real life in the olden time, billed to perform regular at one o'clock a.m.? Well, next thing you know, Mr. and Mrs. Chittenden would be off in a spring cart of the county asylum. Later in the day, in what is offensively called the smoke room of the hotel, the two men's conversation continued. Honestly, Mr. Dillett, I don't know where it come from. It'd be some country house that anyone could guess, but I'll go so far as to say this. I believe it's not an hundred miles from this place. The man I actually paid the cheque to ain't one of my regular suppliers, and I've lost sight of him. But I have the idea that this part of the country was his beat, and that's every word I can tell you. The next day, Mr. Dillett repaired to the local institute, where he hoped to find the clue to the riddle that absorbed him. He gazed in despair at a long line of the Canterbury and York Society's publications of the parish registers of the district. No print resembling the house of his nightmare was among those that hung on the staircase and in the passages. Disconsolate, he found himself at last in a derelict room, staring at a dusty model of a church in a dusty glass case. Model of St. Stephen's Church, Coxham, presented by J. Merriweather, Esquire, of Illbridge House, 1877. The work of his ancestor, James Merriweather, died 1786. There was something in the fashion of it that reminded him dimly of his horror. Dillett hurriedly looked out Ilbridge House in the register. It was not long before he found in there the record of the burial of Roger Milford, aged 76, on the 11th of September, 1757, and of Roger and Elizabeth Merriweather, aged nine and seven, on the 19th of the same month. It seemed worth while to follow up this clue, and in the afternoon he drove to Coxham. In the north aisle of the church there was the Milford family chapel, on whose walls were tablets to the same persons. One slab told of James Merriweather, who in the dawn of life practised those arts which, had he continued, might have earned for him the name of the British Vitruvius but who, overwhelmed by the visitation which deprived him of his blooming offspring and later his grieving wife, passed his prime and age in a secluded yet elegant retirement. Mr. Dillett felt sure that in Illbridge House he had found the scene of his drama, but he was unable to satisfy his curiosity. Apparently an older property had been demolished, to make way for the red-brick mock Elizabethan dwelling which currently occupies the site. As he drove out of the village, the hall's clock struck four, and Mr. Dillett started up and clapped his hands to his ears. It was not the first time he had heard that bell.